Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab them or turn them on and head on over to Psalm 73. Uh, we are in the last series of our summer series of in the Psalms because this is the last Sunday of the summer. Next Sunday, the 22nd, is the first day of fall, and we will be starting off our fall series looking at the book of Ruth. But for now, we are in Psalm 73, and as Ron so wonderfully mentioned for me, he he kind of preached my message. I don't even have to say much anymore, but uh, is that we're going to be looking at the world around us. We need a new perspective when we see the raging world, and we find that new perspective in our Lord. And so I titled this sermon, what what did I title this sermon? (laughs) Where is God when the wicked succeed? This is what happens when you write a week ahead. But where is God? God when the wicked succeed, because it feels like the wicked are getting away with everything, but the righteous are left to just flounder and stumble and fall and be crushed. So where is God when the wicked succeed? And Psalm 73 begins with a statement of simple truth. This is what it says in the first verse. It says, truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. Now, what we see at work here in the first verse is something that's called a parallelism. And parallelisms are very common in Hebrew poetry. If you read any of the Hebrew poetry, you're going to see a lot of this throughout the verses. It's a common occurrence. And so what verse 1 said is, truly God is good to Israel. And then what does it say? It says, to those who are pure in heart. And that's the parallelism. To those who are pure in heart is the qualification or the amplification of Israel. God's true people, this is what it means. God's true people are those whose hearts are turned to him and to those people whose hearts are turned to him, God is good to those people. This is what Asaph is saying. This is a simple truth. The rest of the psalm, however is dedicated to showing how hard it is sometimes to believe and be content with knowing that God is good. Has anyone ever struggled with that thought? God, are you truly good? It's okay, you don't have to lie. I know I've been there too. We have all questioned that once or twice throughout of our Christian journey. And so according to the superscription of this one, uh, the author of this psalm is Asaph. He is the Levite whom David placed in charge of the musical worship before the ark in Jerusalem. So he's a worship leader. He is always worshiping and conducting worship. You can read about him in 1 Chronicles 16, 5 to 7 for some more context. But Asaph was a prominent figure, and no doubt he was a deeply spiritual man as he led the worship in Israel. But despite these qualifications, his psalm records a descent into a discontentness with God in his providence, and then we're going to see a spiritual recovery going right from the lowest lows to the highest highs that not only restored Asaph to his faith, but also elevated him to one of the highest stages of spirituality in all of the Old Testament. So that's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at the problem with discontentment first, and then we're going to look at four steps that Asaph took to spiritually recover himself. So let's begin with the first one, the problem with discontentment. To quote Jeremiah Burroughs, the English Puritan, he wrote about Asaph's struggle. He, 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 was, he used this as one of his scriptures in his 1648 spiritual classic, The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment. He offered a lengthy reflection on Paul's declaration in Philippians 4.1 where Paul says famously, I have learned in whatever situation to be content. A lot of us have that on our coffee cups, but we're not content in every situation, are we? Right? But Paul says, I have learned how in whatever situation to be content. And Burroughs defines contentment this way. He says, it's that sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit which freely submits to the, and delights in God's wise and fatherly disposal in every condition. I love that definition of contentment. Another Puritan, Thomas Watson, also spoke helpfully about contentment. He says, we glorify God by being content in the state in which providence has placed us. We give God the glory of his wisdom when we rest satisfied with what he carves out to us. 
or maybe the common expression, whatever the cards have been dealt to us. We are joyful, we are content in those things. But most of us, if you're anything like me, we find it hard to be content with what the circumstances God has given to us. We're always looking at what I call the greener grass syndrome, right? The grass is always green on the other side, but then you get there and you realize it's astroturf, right? It's fake. So, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Come some more, yeah? No, I'm just joking. <laughs> but really, <laughs> We, what happens is that we're not satisfied with God and his provisions in our lives. And what that actually boils down to is that we're not just dissatisfied with God as what he's given to us in our lives and the, and the cards that he has dealt to us, but we're actually dissatisfied with God himself. This is a curious phenomenon. Because nowhere can you read in the Bible where it promises you as a follower of Christ happy trails and sunshine and rainbows and smooth sailing for all of your life. That's not what we get when we read the Bible about godly men and women who follow Christ. We actually see quite the opposite, don't we? We see a lot of trials and hardships and pains and loss which should show us that God's people, which are you and me in Christ, We'll be bombarded with troubles. I know, what a joyful message. Bombarded with troubles. Look at what the Apostle Peter writes. He says, beloved, that's you, church. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trials when it comes upon you to test you as though something is strange happening to you. Do you understand what he's saying? Don't be surprised when life is hard, when you have trials, like this is something foreign or strange. This, meaning, this is natural. This is something that is probably going to be happening. Don't be surprised by this because we are his children. God gives us trials as we read throughout his word to strengthen our character, but also to draw us close to him. Since we have been told this, it's actually inconsistent for us to be discontent in our circumstances of difficulty. But the truth is we are, aren't we? I know I get there. And no matter how un, however unreasonable our discontentment is, the Bible shows us that we have great company in our misery. The prophet of Habakkuk climbs into his watchtower to await God's justification for all the woes that he is inflicting on Israel. The prophet Jeremiah was a distinguished complainer. Job, who had a better grounds than any of us to be discontent, exercised them vigorously. And then here in Psalm 73, we have a great man like Asaph saying, But as for me, my feet almost stumbled, my steps nearly slipped. The first section of Psalm 73 from verses 2 to 15 records Asaph's descent into a spiritual depression beginning with envy towards the ungodly. Verse 3 says, For I was envious. Why were my feet about to slip? Remember verse 2? For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Asaph marshals an impressive, imp- uh, 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 an impressive argument for his envy. He begins with two observations that cause him to resent God's rule in God's affair. First he says, I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity. So first is prosperity of the wicked. Second, the ungodly seem to lead happy and carefree lives. Look at verses 4 to 5. For they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are not fat. Or sorry, are fat and sleek. Remember, there's not a lot of food back then. Uh, and they are not in trouble as others and are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Talking about the wicked. These are observations that we tend to make too as modern humans, since we are always, throughout humanity, one of our major problems is that we're prone to resentment. We've all said this before, Lord, I've been faithful to you. Have you ever said that? Lord, I've been praying every day. I've been reading your word. I've been going to church without missing one Sunday. And yet you're treating me like this? Why is this still happening to me? Because we're looking at God as some type of equation where if I do good, then he does good, and if I do bad, then he does bad. That is not the God of the Bible. Do you get that, church? That is not the God of the Bible. He's not a a vending machine in the sky that if you type in the code the right way, something good's going to come out. God is always good, and God is always love, and God is always for his people. 
Whether you deserve it or not, that's what the Bible says. Because actually you can do nothing to invoke his goodness. He is good to you because he is love. You need to understand that. It will change. It will give you a different perspective on the God that you serve. Or we also are faced with this not just in our personal times of trial, but maybe when a good person dies in our life, we think things like, why him, God? Why her? They have always lived a decent life, but the drunk who's never sober never seems to get sick or struggle. But my faithful aunt, my faithful mom, my faithful dad dies early to our understanding. I know that's a little uncomfortable to think about, but that's what pain makes you think. I know I thought it in light of my father's death, who did everything he could to live for the Lord and died at 49. And I question, well, why him and not the drug dealer? Those are the hard realities of pain. That's where your mind as a sinful human will want to go. We want to ask questions as, how is that right? How is this just? And the Bible depicts that. It doesn't shy away from this reality. We see throughout all the pages a godly man like Joseph can be sold into slavery by his brothers and then their brothers fabricate this deceitful story and guess who believes it? Their dad. And they get away with it, seemingly. This is the world that we live in, that righteous Lazarus can become a cripple and live in misery outside the gates of a pompous rich man who cares nothing for him. Lazarus just lies there on his mat as dogs lick his sores, and then he dies. It's not hard to ask God in those moments, what kind of world are you running? What's going on here? What kind of justice is there when this is happening, God? Well, and here's the cold reality. We'll flesh the answer out a little bit more, but here's the cold reality, is that we live in a cold, cruel world. Why? Because it's been broken and scarred by sin. This isn't meant to be our eternal home right here, how life is right now. There is something better coming, a new heaven and a new earth, amen? Amen. I don't know. Are you really looking forward to that? There's a new heaven and a new earth coming. Amen? Amen. Amen. That will not be scarred by sin, will not be broken by pain or suffering. We'll never have to ask the question of why so-and-so our loved one suffered and died because everything will be corrected. Everything will be restored. But here we see things get worse. Asaph points out that the wicked exult in their villainy. They don't just get away with it, but they're, 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 they're being exalted. And it says, therefore, in verse 6, <clears throat> pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out of their fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Lawfully, they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens and their tongue struts through the earth. Therefore, his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? They're speaking against God and also even saying arrogantly in their pride that God doesn't even care or know. He's not powerful enough. That's what the wicked are saying to stop them on their journey. The unrighteous laugh at the righteous. They mock their victims and they boast in the face of a mighty God. Yet lightning never strikes them. They seemingly get away with it. Far from it, what we actually see is they win awards, they garner praise, and people fawn over them while the righteous are despised. Imagine, for instance, someone who commits a terrible crime. Perhaps they commit assault or even murder. And then they get off in the courts on a technicality. Just picture that. Imagine how that victim feels, how that victim's parents or family feels, But then it gets worse. The criminal begins to boast about it, taunting the victim. He writes a book about how he got off on a technicality, and guess what? It becomes a bestseller. He laughs about the pitiful people who do good and trust in God. It is, is there anything more galling than that? I've been wronged, and they get away with it. And not just wrong like they spoke bad about me, but they murdered my friend or they assaulted me. Perhaps something like this has happened to you where somebody has done something so cruel towards you and have seemingly got away with it and you're embittered by it. Asaph was the author of this psalm 
Asaph was undone by the envy for success of the wicked, and he was indignant over God's providential orderings. By thinking this way, Asaph went to the logical end of that thought, which is he ended up blaming God and found himself in a spiritual abyss. Asaph reached rock bottom. Look at verses 12 to 13. You might have to, there we go. Behold, they, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches. All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. This is a terrible conclusion that he's at. Asaph finds himself saying, it is not worth serving God. All my religion, all my faith is foolishness if this is the way things are. I've done all this innocently, but look what they've done and they get away with it. My religion, my faith in Yahweh is useless. Maybe you've said something like that. Well, if that's how Christians are, then I don't want any part of this. Well, if that's how things are, then I don't think you're the God that I should actually serve. You see the error in thinking like that? First came envy in Asaph, and then indignation, and then self-pity made its appearance, and finally he finds himself denying altogether the value of serving God. Now Asaph is the one mocking God, along with the, micket, the, the wicked. Having envied the ungodly, he is now modeled into their image. He is stooping to their level, to their attitude, and to their sinful speech. He's joining in with their refrain against God. Referring to this spiritual descent, the psalmist said, but as for me, my feet almost stumbled, my steps nearly slipped. He was almost there. It's important to see what kept his foot from slipping completely. What was the foothold in which he found traction and from which he began to make his spiritual climb back up? He answers in verse 15. It's very beautiful. If I had said I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. It's really interesting. This assessment shows that Asaph realizes just how ridiculous was his self-pitying attitude, yet only concern for the influence that he might have on others checked his free fall, brought him back to reality. In this, he shows the value there is in being part of a Christian community, being part of a church. How often when we are too stubborn or too depressed to care about ourselves that our love for others keeps us moving, keeps us going. I don't feel like doing this, but I know sister so-and-so depends on me and I'm going to show up for her. I'm going to show up for him. How often, because we're in community and we love each other in this church, that keeps us moving forward. It's one of the purposes of gathering. If we're ever thinking the way Asaph was, then we should follow his example. He waited to report his feelings and his thoughts until he had worked his way out of the difficulties and was able to say once again, truly, God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But how did he get there? How did he get to be able to come back from all that garbage, that descent to the lowest of lows and build his way back up to be able to say, truly, God is good? Did he just wake up one day, he had a little bit of food, got a nap, oh, I feel a lot better, I feel like praising God now? No. Sometimes that is the issue. You actually read that in the Bible, hey, take a nap, eat some food, you'll feel better, right? But uh, not here. Not here. He was angry with God. He was ready to walk away from God. What brought him back to be able to confess the Lord is good? The Lord is truly good. Well, he went through four steps that I've called spiritual recovery, and that's what we're going to look at. His four steps of climbing back to the right attitude towards God. And these four steps we should also follow when we feel that we need to escape from our self-pity and our despair in our lives because that creeps in so easily. The first appears in verses 16 to 17. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I discerned their end. Here Asaph provides one of the key keys to stability and growth for us as followers of Christ. When we're floundering, when we're stumbling, when we feel like life is too much and I can't go on because of doubt and discouragement, or when we can no longer remember a time in our life when we felt safe and happy as Christians, what enables us to 
regain our foothold, our position? The answer is, in verse 17, I went into the sanctuary of God. The psalmist went to church, if we're going to use modern language. In his case, he went into the tabernacle. And that's the first step in spiritual recovery is worship God with God's people. It's that simple. What he encountered there brought a perspective to him that he had forgotten. He was confronted in the tabernacle of God with a mighty and holy saving God. And that realization changed everything for Asaph. How important it is to come into a place of worship. When I encounter Christians who are badly fallen, who have stumbled, who feel like they give up, most of the time it is because they have ceased attending the regular gathering of worship with God's people. Or they went on autopilot, they're in the chairs, but they've checked out from reality. And you get to see this spiritual decline and their life begins to crash around them. Because this is why God said it was important to gather with his people. You don't come here Sunday after Sunday so we can say, hey, look how many people we have, or to put another check on our box for the pastor. No, you come to gather with God's people to be encouraged by God's people so that in my brokenness, when I am weak, I know that Ron is going to help me up, that Corey is going to help me up. That Agnes is going to play so wonderfully and bring glory to my heart and soul as I worship Jesus. That I'm going to be able to see over to my right side. That's my left side. That's your right, right? And I'm going to see brother so-and-so who I knew who's been through the ringer. And I'm going to see tears stream down from his faith as he continues to choose to trust in the Lord. And I'm going to see that and that's going to bring glory and hope to me and strengthen my broken heart as we walk around. That's the purpose of worshiping together, that we have our, not just our eyes closed, but we're actually looking at brothers and sisters and children singing and praising to our king. And that encourages us. That's one of the reasons why we must be constant in our worship and to thrive as Christians. And it lies in gathering within the local church. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones explains it best. He says, people who neglect attendance at the house of God are not only being unscriptural, let me put it bluntly, they are fools. My experience in the ministry has taught me that those who are least regular in their attendance are are the ones who are most troubled by problems and perplexities. It is a very foolish Christian who does not attend the sanctuary of God as often as he possibly can. Now, that's not saying you can't go on vacation with your family and miss a Sunday or you get sick or you just wake up and you just can't get there. That's, but it means that you are in a regular habit of forsaking God and his people. It's just me and Jesus. That's all I need. Well, clearly you haven't read your Bible. Clearly you haven't read your Bible. You are called to gather, not even just for yourself, but for somebody else so they can see you continuing in your faith, persevering over the hardships of life. And they can be encouraged that they can look around and say, yeah, Lawrence Oford showed me the way by just showing up every Sunday and praising God. Fill in that blank. So-and-so showed up and they encouraged me to continue on. We need each other. We need to be in worship together because only then do things come into proper focus. So Asaph says, I could make sense of this. I was miserable, I was confused, I was bitter, but then I went into the sanctuary. I went before God, I stopped accusing him, I stopped arguing with him, and I simply came before him as my God. When I saw him again, My problems began to resolve themselves. Everything began to look different when I looked to the Lord. Have you ever experienced that kind of new perspective in prayer? Right, you're embroiled in a little bit of a controversy, maybe with somebody in the church or in your family or in work or whatever it might be. Yes, controversies happen. We're all humans. And it seems to be consuming your life. You're not sleeping at night. And then you go, wait a minute, I haven't even prayed about this yet. And then you bring it to God in prayer And what normally starts to happen is you go, wow, I'm being really ridiculous, Andre. It starts to take your eyes off of, well, so-and-so did this, and that's why I did that. Who cares? You're a sinner. 
Own your sin. And you start to realize, oh, I'm being a little bit ridiculous in this. And it starts to change your perspective. You become like Job, right, who questioned God's wisdom in Job 38. And he says, uh, 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 God responds to him. He says, who is it that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? God saying, hey, I'm the Alpha and Omega. I'm the God who knows everything. You're nothing. And you're going to counsel me with no knowledge? And then later on in the book, Job responds a little embarrassed. He goes, I have heard you by my hearing of the ear, but now I, I see you, therefore I despise myself and I repent in dust and ashes. He had a perspective change. How foolish we can be. How quick do we jump to self-pity and depression. And for this very reason, we need to be diligent in our study of God's word in reading it, in our study of God's awesome attributes and how great he actually is and to focus in on God's saving power and God's saving work. We need to be regular in our prayer, but especially we must be often in the sanctuary of God, present with God's people in worship. These are our only protections against mainly ourselves, against our sin, against folly and weakness, and of course, against the devil. Coming into the sanctuary was the first step in Asaph's spiritual journey to recovery, and we too must come before God. Do not try to solve your problems on your own. What do we do? We, things start to go wrong, and we go, well, I'm going to jump in, and I'm going to fix this, and we get halfway down the road. We see it's a mess, and we start going, well, maybe I should have talked to God first. If you're anything like me, I'm not mechanically inclined, and I had a window that fell into my car a couple years ago, and I said, well, YouTube can show me how to do this. And so I took apart my door panel. I got that part really easy. (laughs) Couldn't get it back together. So I took it to the mechanic shop. You know what they put on the bill? Customer tried it on his own, couldn't do it, needed help. (laughs) I did. I thought I knew what I was doing. I took matters into my own hands. And I cost it me more money. Okay. And so, but the same thing is what we do with our life with God. We go, well, I can do this. I got all these other avenues I can try first. And we make a mess of it. And we go, oh, I should have, just, should have just talked to God first, to the ultimate mechanic, to the ultimate fixer. We must come before God. Second, Psalm 73, 17 tells the immediate effects of his, uh, Asaph's return to God. It says, eh, it won't change. You might have to change it to 17. It says, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I discerned their end. When Asaph put his eyes onto God, his perspective became different. His horizons were enlarged. Specifically, Asaph noticed something that he had forgotten in his angry descent, namely the end that awaits the ungodly. And that is the second step into, understand, uh, into spiritual Growth and recovery is understanding the destination of the godly. Remember, we're speaking of the concept of a man who is looking around at the wicked and who are seemingly get away with it. It says in 18 to 20, truly you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors. Like a dream when one awakens, O Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. Asaph had forgotten about the final judgment, just like we often do. But what a difference remembering this makes in our assessment of life, the judgment of God. There is a judgment at the end of the days. Therefore, though the wicked may have carefree and prosperous lives now, although that's hardly the case, we just focus in on the ones that do, although this, uh, uh, though they may avoid punishment in this life and in this world, Though they may gloat in their violence and in their crime, there is a judgment that they cannot and will not escape outside of Christ. While the rich man in Jesus' parable, who was too self-absorbed to notice the sufferings of righteous Lazarus, the story of these two men did not end at death. The man of God who suffered in life was blessed in death, while the arrogant rich man suffered in torment for his sins. And this is the perspective that Asaph regained. Then I discerned their end. 
This is, the, this is very important because we as Christians, we tend to look around at all those who are living their lives opposed to God, and we think maybe we're somehow missing out. Have you ever heard of FOMO, right, the fear of missing out, right? Somehow we're missing out on what's going on, but when we discern their end, we realize that, sure, things might look really good right now, if that's what you call good, but their destination is one that we should never envy. I remember once I was doing some sermon prep in the coffee shop. I like to do that every once in a while. The office gets a little too quiet and scary. I don't know. People open shelves and walk around and don't claim they're here. Um, but anyways, just take that as you are. There's two ghosts here, the Holy Ghost and some other guy. But uh, I'm kidding. But I like to go into the coffee shop, and I like some noise. And I like to be with the people of Drumheller and, and kind of see them passing by as I prep my sermons. And uh, the coffee shop was enormously quiet that day. Uh, but there was two gentlemen speaking in the corner. And the one was speaking loud and boisterous, holding the room to attention with his voice. And I overheard, maybe I eavesdropped a little, but I overheard. Um, and I just heard them talking. And, and the man was talking about uh, many subjects. He went from debunking religion as a fraud and he extolled the virtues of his carefree, happy-go-lucky life. And I felt many things as I listened to this man, but envy was not one of them. Apart from the obvious folly of his pleasure-seeking life, there is a judgment of God to be faced. Being at enmity with God, the man was at peace with the world and with his sin. Of course, a person who's at enmity with God is carefree now because he's a child of this present age with no struggle against the flesh, the world, or even the devil. Meanwhile, the believer, you and I, we have peace with God, but we have ceaseless conflict in this present life. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, right? It's against principalities, powers, spirits, and all the rest. But none of, us, none of us, my Christian struggles made me envy the man at the coffee shop. Unless he were to repent from his sins and turn to God in faith, how sure and sudden would be his fall to inescapable doom. And recounting that story as I wrote this sermon made me think about verse 18 of Psalm 73, which is truly you set them on slippery places and you make them fall to ruin. This man was on a slippery slope and was joyful about it. Slides are fun. Slides are a lot of fun until you realize where the destination is. You have a lot of joy getting there until you land. Worldly and sinful, this is what, sorry, verse 20 asserts. It says, like a dream, when one awakes, O Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. And that's what worldly and sinful happiness is. It has no more security, no more substance than a dream that allures us in our sleep. Has anyone else ever had a really good dream? And then you wake up and you go, oh, that was a dream? Hey, you kind of feel bummed out about it for the rest of the day. You don't know why? Because that dream was so good. Well, this is what the psalmist is saying that sinful living is like. It's alluring. It promises a lot. It feels so good. But one day you're going to wake up. One day you're going to wake up. Like Haman's situation in the book of Esther, the gallows that the ungodly erect will one day become the instrument of their own demise. Like a house that is built on a fault, fault line, all happiness, in, all happiness in sin rests on one brink of woe. Do you realize this? Instead of envying the wicked, do you look on their mocking and arrogant unbelievers and pity them for their laughter and pray for them? Do you mourn over the calamity of their sins? Does it motivate you to share Christ with them? Not being able to speak with that man at the coffee shop, although I offered, I said, hey, I hear you debunked religion. I'm a pastor. I'd love to have a conversation about that. He, he said, no, I don't have time. <laughs> That's okay. He was retired, so I think he made that up. <laughs> I'm kidding. So I prayed for him in that moment. I prayed for him that God would wake him up from his dreamy state before it was too late. So instead of complaining, this is what it does when we have a perspective change. Instead of complaining about our troubles, we become more fervent in our prayer, more diligent in our witness. We don't want to leave these people in their dreamy states. And we become more sober in our own lives. 
Psalm 37, 1 to 2, King David writes, Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers, for they soon shall fade like grass and wither like the green herb. So the third step in Asaph's recovery comes when he applied these insights to himself. Earlier in his depressed state, he complained about how he was living and the living of a righteous man. Now he realizes that everything that he was thinking about the other people, the wicked people, are actually true about himself. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in the heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast towards you, speaking to God. So the third step is a sobering self-reflection. If the wicked were foolish and brute beasts before God, the same was no less true of Asaph and his accusations against God because of his discontentment. Likewise, it is necessary for mine and your spiritual well-being that we become more aware of our own sin, our own guilt, and our own unworthiness. Earlier I cited coming in to the gathering of God's people, the regular attendance of God's worship, worship of God's people as a barometer for your spiritual health. But there's another one. If we are always boastful and arrogant before God, we can know surely that we are far from him. I like how the great C.S. Lewis puts it. He says, whenever we find that our religious life is making us feel that we are good above all, that we are better than someone else, I think we may be sure that we are being acted on not by God, but by the devil. The real test of being in the presence of God is that you either forget about yourself altogether or see yourself as a small, dirty object. This attitude of self-abasement is not a morbid self-loathing, but a healthy realism about our sin in the presence of God's holiness. What's worse than meeting a Christian who thinks they're holier than thou? Oh, I'd never struggle with that. What closes a church more than a bunch of self-righteous Christians gathering together, hating the world? The Bible, whenever people really are brought to see God, come into a clear understanding of who they are as a person. They see themselves as naked and dirty like Adam and Eve when they sinned and they were needing to be clothed. Or Peter, when he responded to his awareness of God's presence, the way that Peter spoke when he perceived the deity of Christ, he said, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. If you are disappointed with what God is providing you in your life, I assure you that you fail to appreciate your own sin and your own guilt. Therefore, we shall all pray for a fresh remembrance of our sin. Why? Because blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The first step to recovery is to come before God in holy worship. Second, we must realize the end that awaits the ungodly world so that we have a perspective change, but also motivate it to reach the world. And then third, we also notice that it's precisely, this is our own predicament. We are also wicked outside of Christ, which leads to the fourth step of spiritual recovery, which is a nice long one for you because I couldn't keep it short. <clears throat> a fresh appreciation of the blessing we enjoy in the unmerited grace of God. When Asaph realizes that he himself is among the wicked, deserving of judgment and destruction like the others that he was so enamored by, he remembers with joy the blessing that he previously despised. He says, Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. However wonderful it is, he's saying, to put it in my own language, though I have been such a sinner, he's saying, that God is nonetheless with me. He holds me in his hand. He guides me in, his, in this life. Despite all I have done or left undone, there is glory ahead into which God is taking me. Asaph has arrived at the doctrine of salvation by grace alone. The Bible's teaching that God has freely provided sinners a way to their salvation. God provides grace through faith in Jesus Christ, and each of us is foolish, brutish beasts before God. Our lives are in sin. Our lives that are in sin are built upon the fault line of coming doom. They're not secure without Christ. But God sent his son to save us, fulfilling the demands of his law 
on our behalf, weaving by the life that he gave a garment of righteousness that we are all clothed in in Christ, and then bearing the punishment of mine and your sin upon that cursed tree. Through faith alone, God offers the benefits of Christ's saving work. Why? Because for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Amen? Amen. The same doctrine that offered to us of salvation in the first place, salvation by grace alone, also preserves us from discontentment. Why are you unhappy? It's probably because you think you deserve something that you aren't getting. Yet in truth, the thing that you deserve to get that you're not getting is the God's judgment for your sins. While deserving only judgment from God, which all of us do, we are instead, as his people, receiving an inheritance to eternal life through Christ Jesus. That's grace. You're getting something you don't deserve. Your great spiritual blessings were gained at an infinite cost to God, whom we are so prone to resent in our lives. The song realizes this gospel truth and it leads him to an upward recovery. God has saved us at a high cost by the precious blood of his son. And he now sends his Holy Spirit into our hearts that we might have fellowship with him. God has given the light of the world to guide us and to assure us of hope and glory that awaits us in eternity. So how can we complain? How can we harbor discontentment to such a wonderful Savior. When trials and discontentments come and we endure them, they also come, here's the perspective change, with a promise of glory ahead. In a light, in this light, we see sorrows now and pains and sufferings as an instrument that God is using to wean us from the idols of this world that we're so prone to run to and draw us to his heart which leads me to my final point, and very brief, is that God should be our portion forever. He should be the thing that satisfies us. When we are struggling with sin, when we are always running back to that thing that we just can't seem to kill, and I have a great ministry for you, which is Freedom Session, that you should jump in if that's you, but why we're heading there is because we are minimizing God. We are not seeing God as our source of satisfaction. We're not seeing God as our portion forever, but we are seeing the sin as something that is greater than God. And so what John Piper says is that whenever we sin, it's because we are not satisfied completely by God. Because what we're sinning, what we're running to, we're saying is greater than God. He is not our portion together. And so verses 25 to 26 says, Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail you, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Get this, that both the statements in the psalm, the beginning ones of despising God and this one glorifying God, come from the same man. Come from Asaph. He goes from ready to give up on God, to glorifying God. And this shows us how important it is for us to have a biblically sound mind because the same man, Asaph, finds himself in the pit or in the highest heights of the mountain, all depending on the way he allows himself to think. Verse 25 and 26 of Psalm 73 are so great that I'm almost afraid to even expound upon them because I would only tarnish them. So let me say this in light of those great verses on the screen. We can reflect upon this truth that happiness cannot be found in anything that this world has to offer. Not in money, not in achievement, not in career success, not in romance, not in pleasure. Only God can fulfill our hearts. God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. If we have him, we have what we really need and we can be content. How much more must this be true for our eternal destiny as we look to the great coming promise of Jesus Christ? If we have him, we have what we need. This is my certain hope, that my flesh and my heart may fail us, verse 26 says, and indeed they certainly will. As we age, we realize that our bodies begin to break down. Things fail. But here's the truth. In all that this body lacks, 
and all that this world lacks and, and all that this life lacks, God still abounds. God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And when I consider this, why would I place anything before my relationship to God? Why would I complain if I have him? God is what I really need. God is what you need. Earlier, I mentioned Burroughs' book, The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment. I want to close by reading one more quote from him. It is not necessary for me to be rich, but it is necessary for me to make my peace with God. It is not necessary that I should live a pleasurable life in this world, but it is absolutely necessary that I should have pardon of my sin. It is not necessary that I should have honor and preferment, but it's necessary that I should have God as my portion and have my part in Jesus Christ. It is necessary that my soul should be saved in the day of Jesus Christ. The other things are perfectly fine indeed, and I should be glad if God would give them to me, a fine house, an income, and clothes, an advancement for my wife and children. These are comfortable things, but they are not the necessary things. I may have these things and yet perish forever, but the other is absolutely necessary to have God, to have pardon for my sins. And this is the, clearly the position that Asaph has arrived at. He concludes with great realization and firm resolution. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish, but you put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. <clears throat> but for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge that I may tell of your works. That's heaven, that we will be with God. And it's something that we don't need to wait to enjoy until we're there. We, if we share Asaph's need to be near to God, we will concern ourselves far less with the things of this world and far more with the things of God, which are faith, and holiness, and service to God, and our witness to this dying world. Church, let us not just discern the end of the wicked and go, wow, Lord, you go to deal with them, but let's live as lights in this dark world, amen? amen? That we can shine bright the gospel of Jesus Christ before it is too late. For when he comes, he is not coming as a gentle lamb, but he is coming as a conquering king. We are now and the age of salvation, the age of the church. Let's go forth into our mission, not envying the world, not going, oh, am I missing out on this? God, why are they getting away with that? Going, no, they need the gospel. They need to know that Jesus came and lived the life they could never live, died the death that they should have died, and rose again, offering salvation to all men and women and children who confess his name. So if you're here today and you have not bowed your knee to Christ, Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, guess what? You will be saved. Amen? Amen. Let's pray as we close in a hymn. Father, I praise you and I thank you, O Lord, that you are a good and gracious God, that we don't have to do all these things and check all these boxes in order to enter into eternal rest with you. But Lord, we just have to trust in you by your power. You sent your son to die for us and to make a way for us to be saved. We are saved by grace through faith. Not by our own works, as Ephesians says, but by your power. And we thank you for that. And Lord, those of us who are here who are maybe in the midst of feeling discontent in their circumstances or in their life or even towards you, Father, may they look at those four steps we saw today. Would they prioritize gathering with your people and being present in worship? Father, may they remember that they're not missing out on anything, but they have all they need in you. And Father, may they also realize that you have been so gracious towards them in your forgiveness of their sins and lord would they know that you are their portion forever and that they can rest in that be kind to us today O lord bless us as we close in a song in jesus name amen